Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I think you'll agree with me, we've had two very uh, excellent presentations uh, covering both the uh, theoretical and the practical uh, as we've explored uh, the role of navies uh, in foreign policy. Uh, I think the, uh, the utility of uh, Ken Booth's model, which we've adopted into our doctrine as well, the trinity of uh, naval utility, naval roles, as the military, the constabulary, policing and the diplomatic uh, has stood the test of time and I suspect will do. The mechanics of achieving those roles uh, may well change, but I think the underlying principles uh, are very sound. Uh, and Admiral, your, uh, your take on uh, how the UK uh, has exercised uh, its foreign policy or, or, or contributed to its foreign policy through its use of its navy uh, was excellent. Like one statistic there that jumped out at me was 20 navy chiefs uh, educated by the Royal Navy. That's uh, that's quite a statistic, I think. Uh, but I, I think, and, and most will probably agree with me, the Royal Navy in particular has a very strong, proud history of using its navy very, very successfully in the diplomatic role and has had for, uh, for, for centuries. Um, we'll open the floor to questions now. Uh, same ground rules as before. Please uh, identify yourself and uh, your affiliation where necessary. Restrict yourself, if you can, to, uh, to questions rather than comments. Uh, there is one area I'd like to declare um, off limits, if I may. Uh, the, uh, it was raised briefly yesterday and this morning, um, but looking at the, uh, the nationalities and seniority on the stage, I don't think there's anything to be gained by any questions relating to the recent history of cricket between Australia and England, <laughs> and uh, I suspect even less by predicting what the future summer may hold. So if we could uh, hold fire on those questions, I personally would be very appreciative. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd open the floor now to, uh, to questions to either of our speakers, please. So in the centre there. Navy League of Australia. Firstly, Admiral, let me say it's wonderful that the Royal Navy is re-entering the realm of organic, fixed-wing naval aviation. It's great. A facility without which, in my humble opinion, no Navy is complete, without which, in my humble opinion, any Navy is unacceptably vulnerable. Now, Admiral, you mentioned the uh, the F-35B, we have been receiving quite mixed messages about the likely effectiveness of this aircraft and the F-35, in fact. Since the F-35B is going to be fundamental to the use of your naval aviation, what is your take on the likely effectiveness of this aircraft? Thank you. Well, as an aviator, I can't tell I'm tell you how pleased I am to get that question. Thank you very much. See me later. Um, I think I have to answer you in a way which is um, rather fuller than perhaps you expected. First of all, let me just mention the carrier as a platform. This, uh, this vessel, these acres of deck, um, are going to be with us in our service for about 50 years from now. And if you think about the evolutionary nature of technology over the last 50 years, go back 50 years in your head and see where we were. But don't draw a straight line. Extrapolate ahead in a non-linear, exponential fashion. And you'll see that the first bunch of things that land on the deck of this, of this big ship will be very, very different to the last bunch of things that land on the deck in 50 years' time. That's, of course, if we don't do what we always do, which is extend the life of a platform. And I think that the journey of technology really is at the heart of the answer I'd like to give you. The F-35B is the beginning of its life, um, and we don't know yet how much we're going to develop from it. It's very easy to speculate, but we do know from history that whatever you start with, you tend to get a lot more over the years. And I have a huge confidence in the design team that have put together this platform. It is not a conventional jet. It doesn't really look like a conventional jet, and I don't think it's going to behave like a conventional. It's not a fighter in the conventional sense. It's incredibly easy to fly. In fact, it's irritatingly easy to fly. Um, and that's deliberate, because actually it's a platform to be operated for a multitude of, of uh, capabilities. So wrestling the beast to the deck on a dark and stormy night to catch the wire, that's the conventional variant. You know, that's, that's not what this is about. It's like running a taxi firm where the most exciting part is putting the car in the hangar at the end of the day, in the, in the garage at the end of the day. Can't be the way to do business. This platform will earn its spurs in the air, long range, probably solo, 
pretty stealthily um, with, um, with weapons and sensors that will require huge bandwidth to maximize the capability of what they see and bring it back to not just the carrier, but perhaps more importantly to home base or an international cooperation of units. It's a huge technological journey, but at the heart of it is the time and space that we've got to operate the concept, the platform, the jets, and the journey that we're on with our American partners. And just to reiterate, I have huge confidence in what we're going to get. Okay, next question, please. Thanks, uh, James Tadarian, Center for International Security Studies. Um, we've heard the big stick metaphor used recurrently, and it's grounded in a realist perspective about diplomacy. Um, call it coercive diplomacy. Um, I prefer Will Rogers, the great American uh, uh, comedian humorist, who said that diplomacy is the um, art of saying nice doggy until you can find a big rock. Um, I'm saying this is a preliminary to is the notion that diplomacy and naval power can go hand in hand. Um, if you're a realist, as Ken Booth was, I don't know if he still is, um, then it makes sense. But um, if you see another um, worldview in which diplomacy is much more based on persuasion as opposed to dissuasion or coercion, then um, the Navy really isn't really cut out for diplomacy. Um, I'm just saying this as a provocation because I think Ken Booth has actually moved in his position on this since the 70s um, as now one of the leaders of critical security studies looking at non-traditional threats and the need for non-traditional forms of diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, Jim, would you like to take that? Sure. I, I, should, I should do a minor administrative thing. I didn't mention Mahan during my presentation and I would hate for him to come down and uh, haunt me tonight so I can't sleep, so uh, Mahan. <laughs> the, uh, I'm not, I don't know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm not really sure I see the, 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 the real disjunction between the coercive and deterrent uses of, of naval power and the, the persuasive uses of naval power. Uh, I think I tried to lay it, and I mean, you're quite right, the Henry Kissinger formula that I used was from a volume from Kissinger in 1962 about nuclear deterrence. So I've definitely, uh, I've definitely expanded up upon uh, what Kissinger said, but to me it looks like, to me it looks like the very much the same thing. Capability, resolve, you basically state, state what you want or what you don't want, uh, display the capabilities, you make good on it, uh, and convince the other side, convince the other side that, uh, that you will act on what you say and, then sh and that what you, the capabilities that you use will actually, uh, will actually let you follow through on that. Uh, I, haven't, I have to admit that I haven't tracked uh, Ken Booth's evolution as a scholar since uh, 1977 when I was 12 years old. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I, that's, that's one guy's take on it in any event. I don't, I don't really see the, the, the disjunction between the, uh, the, the realist school and, and the more persuasive school of thought. And all I can add to that is um, um, you know, the military arm is a, an arm of the government, government uh, intent. We have to be credible. Uh, my job is about credibility, um, and credibility is all about um, exercising sufficient visible capability at sufficient range and sufficiently uh, believably that the arm of that arm of government amongst the joint set of uh, capabilities, which I think I've just got to mention that cyber's in there with it, just not for completeness, but you know it's 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 a way of seeing the soft elements of capability mixing with the hard elements um, to be able to do the job. And um, I completely agree with the professor that this is about uh, keeping those options open um, in a very uncertain world uh, on the basis of credibility. So that's my job. Actually, my, uh, actually my father, the, something the Admiral said, uh, stirred up a thought, always a dangerous thing. but. Uh, uh, if you think about a specific case in which uh, persuasion works on behalf of the U.S., obviously I'm an American and I spend most of my time uh, studying the United States and East Asia. Uh, think about the United States trying to persuade Japan that it will be there on Japan's behalf. That requires the United States to, to display, to show Japan, convince Japan that it can actually, that it can actually keep forces forward deployed despite anti-access measures. 
uh, and so on and so forth. If the United States fails to persuade Tokyo of that, uh, so the United States essentially starts to lose that persuasive effect and it starts to lose its strategic position in Asia, a very dangerous thing that might then send uh, Japan off in a very realist, uh, on a very realist track of itself, uh, uh, as it says, as it pursues self-help, another, uh, another classic realist concept of international affairs. Okay, I think we had one uh, on the right up the back there. Yep. Thank you, sir. Captain Glenn Tinsley, 30 years with the Royal Navy and currently directing Navy Reserve Support uh, here in Australia. Um, sir, I'd, uh, firstly, Lord, sir, I'd be interested to hear any concerns or expectations you have with regards to uh, your Naval Reservists to delivering increased levels of capability into the future, and particularly any cultural barriers you foresee. Well, I see those 30 years were very well spent. Good question. Um, absolutely no concerns at all. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, speculation about the utility of reservists in different forms, in different militaries, in different services. But as far as the maritime is concerned, it's worked absolutely excellently for decades. And we're going to continue to invest and sharpen the opportunity. Um, at the heart, though, perhaps of your question, if I can try to read more into it than you've laid out in front of our colleagues, is whether we take and we will take reservists seriously and see them as an integrated part of the capability. And that, of course, then brings into focus the question of access to reserves within today's competitive workspace, which is less tolerant of those who need time to train and who then are available for short notice deployments. We can cope with that. We really can. I asked the question of our, my own reserves machine very recently of uh, 2,000 individuals I was looking at uh, in, in specific roles, how many employers were they associated with? And I had no idea of the answer until I got it, and the answer was 1,500. So it's effectively, amazingly, a one-to-one -one or virtually one-to-one -one relationship between a reserve and an employer. Many of them are self-employed. So the whole concept of the relationship between uh, availability, time for training, has, has, has been turned into a slightly more subtle um, partnership, if you like, with the industrial, commercial, employment sector. And that means that we probably need to worry a little bit less about access to reserves and concentrate a bit more about how much more we can get from them. We are on a journey of professionalizing and sharpening. I think some of the old days that some of you may remember are pretty much behind us. We simply can't afford to have too comfortable a, um, a force that doesn't feel ready to join equally with its partners in the front line. And to just to give you a, an example of how we're reorganizing, we, uh, we're looking seriously at the possibility of a, a, re a reserves, a f a Royal Naval Reserves element which includes cyber, because that would be a, a beautifully synergized um, relationship between a group of people who have certain skills, but don't necessarily want to spend the whole time coiling up ropes on a deck. In fact, if you asked them to coil up a rope on the deck, they probably wouldn't join in the first place, um, considering they probably would like to wear sandals, have long hair, etc. So, so the, cyber, <laughs> the cyber world is a classic example of how you can cherry pick real skills, really important, almost strategic, but let's call it operation and tactical skills, and grow a capability into a niche part of a, work, of, of a workforce that can fit into a, com a country's a commercial industrial uh, employment market. So I hope that gives you some reassurance. Okay. Uh, Jamie. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Commodore Jamie Hatcher, uh, RAN. Uh, I'd like to sort of um, tease the issue out with you, please, and get both a US and a British perspective in terms of whether you see a convergence between those arms of government that develop foreign policy and therefore diplomatic frameworks um, compared to the military's role in either supporting those endeavours and whether there's a good or improving mutual understanding between the two. I would posit that in the past couple of decades, there has been divergence, and whether you see in both the US and UK governments perhaps uh, a convergence of those two spheres of influence in the diplomatic realm. I'll start because we existed before the United States. 
it's friendly rivalry. Got to keep them in their place. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I mean, we've really learned some lessons, haven't we? And um, uh, I stay within my military authorization here without going too far. I'm very clear as one of the chiefs of staff who operates within a group that advises the chief of defense staff in the UK that our job is to offer um, military considerations based on capability and skill and persistence to um, the strategic judgments of government, not the other way around. That's what, I, that's what my job is. So if your in question implies that you might want to do it the other way around, that's not really the game I'm in, and not, not what my fellow chiefs think. We're here to, to provide um, the best possible range of considerations that, that, that a government may wish to consider. I'm not exactly sure how to come at your question, other than to provide you my own, uh, my own impressions. Uh, the U.S. military culture is, uh, has always been very, very much civilian, so civilian uh, supremacy over policy. And it, it's, my, it's, my, it's my impression that that uh, really persists to this day. Whenever there's uh, something like uh, back in the 2006, the revolt of the generals, or if you want to look back to the 1940s with the revolt of the admirals, this is something that really does not sit well with most, uh, with most naval and military officers. Uh, just a couple of tidbits, uh, just from the Naval War College's perspective, that that I think will back up what I say. If you if you look at our provost, our, our president is a, a Navy admiral, rear admiral, uh, upper half, uh, and our provost is an ambassador. She was formerly an ambassador in South Asia, so so I would certainly offer that as a, at least one anecdotal point uh, showing that we do have uh, good civil military. Uh, integration to a great point. We also get, uh, at the college, we also get uh, State Department representatives on the faculty, also in the students. I had one of my, be one of my favorite students uh, last year was a, uh, was a South Asia expert from the State Department. So it's, I don't know, it's, that's not a very rigorous or systematic answer, but, uh, but it's mine. Okay, I'll just uh, check our Twitter feed and see if we've got anything there. So we don't, uh, don't miss them. No? Okay, any more from the audience, please? So, so uh, Colonel Jim Hutton, the Deputy Commander of the Amphibious uh, Task Group here in Australia. Um, so, uh, Admiral, I was interested in your comments on the uh, Maritime Commitments uh, Strategic Steering Group. Um, and in a previous job in the Ministry of Defence, I, uh, I sat on that um, and was particularly impressed at um, the membership uh, and the depth of membership of that committee um, uh, from a whole of government. Um, as, we, as we look to Australia um, preparing its amphibious capability and putting uh, these rare commodities, these ships, uh, these platforms, these capabilities out into their primary operating uh, region, what advice would you give um, uh, their, their planners uh, in, in Jock uh, about the makeup of such a committee so that when you put a ship out into the region, it's not just there at the behest of the Chief of Navy, but it's there with the backing and with tasks and missions from across government uh, so that we're getting value for money of putting the ship there in the first place uh, and actually meeting the whole sp span and panoply of, of defence engagement uh, as articulated by you in your talk. Jim, is that you in the dark? I can see. Okay, congratulations on your uh, state award. Um, okay, um, so the question boils down to how do you direct the use of expensive utility capability? Um, I think with great discipline. I mean, Australia has a sophisticated um, foreign policy under a new government and all you do is cascade that into a series of effects that you wish to deliver, um, which are measured in certain different ways, but fundamentally all to do with time and space. And, um, and then you identify the means with which to deliver them. And that's why a steering group, which has an all, all points connectivity in it across government, uh, for example, I'll just pr produce some of the edges of that, what that might be. Um, it could include a much more overt approach to cultural issues than have previously existed. It could um, have a much stronger treasury or finance-based element than has 
previously existed. So the idea that the military promote utility through a use it or lose it um, attitude is dangerously distorting the prioritization of capability within a pole mill construct. Interestingly, Jim, the, uh, the UK MOD is now inspecting the, um, the uh, steering group that you refer to, the Maritime Strategic Steering Group concept, and trying to extend it to the other services very rapidly, and is now considering putting a three-star above the whole lot to make sure that the coordination across uh, the domains is effective. And if I could just choose one element to explain how rich that needs to be, we have a Joint Forces Command, as you know, in the UK, and the Joint Forces Command principally is about enabling individual joint domains to be more effective, both singularly and collectively. So in a future joint um, capability, or sorry, a joint strategic steering group for effects, you could argue that that, that joint element, that enabling element is pivotal. It's, it's common sense, it's logic. It's also disciplined. You know, discipline is a key part of this senior management game. And um, you're right to identify that it's a critical path. Thank you. I might uh, just take my moderator's uh, uh, privilege and, uh, and pose a question, if I can, just to pick up on a thread of the last uh, two questions there, and that's the, uh, the impact of technology uh, on diplomacy. We've heard uh, both presentations touched on the whole of government uh, approach to diplomacy now, of which the the military and naval uh, aspects in our case are uh, particularly important. But uh, the last 10 to 15 years in particular, I guess we've seen a, uh, a much greater immediacy of the media. Uh, I think the internet boom and, and communications being uh, very, very quick, um, both within and without, uh, within and external to governments. Uh, has the, uh, the advances in communications and IT in particular um, hindered or helped the whole of government approach that uh, most of our nations seek uh, as they uh, move forward with their, uh, with their diplomatic initiatives, particularly from a naval perspective. <laughs> yeah, I'll take, a, I'll take a stab at that one. I think that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the standard works that I, usually, when I, that I usually reach for when I start thinking through such questions is uh, Essence of Decision, written by a, a couple of gentlemen named uh, Phil Zellico and uh, Graham Allison, who was a, an official in the Clinton uh, in the Defense Department back in the 1990s. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book because they take a multiple looks at how the Kennedy administration made decisions during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and one of the one of the uh, the cuts that they take at uh, Kennedy administration's decision making is bureaucratic politics, or what we call what we tend to call whole of government. I, to me, whole of government is a little bit misleading because it suggests that the government is acting as a whole, whereas uh, whereas the, these two gentlemen suggest that uh, where where you stand depends on where you sit. Each individual agency or individual may have, have his own perspectives and push a push for certain uh, for certain policy outcomes and so on and so forth, uh, and also be and also be susceptible to certain uh, certain inputs from social media, uh, pictures on TV, CNN or what or what have you. This makes it very hard to get everybody uh, pointing in the same direction. They 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 apply the metaphor of vector mechanics, and if. Mo most of you have a mathematical background. Think about vector mechanics. If you have vectors pointing off in all different directions, how do they resolve? They're, they're not likely to resolve in the, in the exact direction that policymakers would like, uh, and, and the magnitude may not be the same, and so on and so forth. So this, may, this is a very, uh, it's a very wicked problem. Uh, I guess if you, if you made, me pick, made me answer uh, yes or no, I would say it's, it's probably hurt, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, my brief cut on the same subject is that um, if I've tried to promote the discipline of uh, analysis to use military effects across the whole of defense in a way which is uh, genuinely considered in time and space, then frankly the realities of the daily life of decision making, uh, political footwork, and public um, uh, effects on political decision making can upset that dynamic. Whereas it took months for weeks for serious information to reach governments, in, the, in 150 years ago, now it's done within seconds, and the government feels, any government feels, it has to react very rapidly to that, and therefore it reaches out across government for any arm that can appear to fix the problem. That's where huge disciplines required in the management of capabilities to provide rapid advice at the level that I operate, 
but also to ameliorate the effects of doing something for the sake of it. Um, so I'm not really sure that's an entirely good answer to your question, but I've just tried to show how technology um, uh, can easily affect um, behaviors and therefore from that perhaps diplomacy that flows. Uh, thanks, sir. Uh, we do have time for some more questions, if there's one up the back. Neil Jones from the Australia Defence Association. My question is to both speakers. In a, in a, in a complex environment where uh, modern communications mean governments are always pressured for here and now decisions, how across the whole of government, not just in the Defence Force, do you get people to think at the grand strategic level for the long term rather than just at the strategic and the strategic policy level, which inevitably has a shorter intellectual horizon? My British colleague is ordering me to start. He's keeping yeah. me in my place again. <laughs> no, you just give me a, t a lecture on how the um, on how you guys start, and then we just do your bidding. So you go in. <laughs> oh yeah, I definitely did that. <laughs> the, uh, it's a it's a great question, and I think they just coming from a, a PME, a professional military education standpoint. I think the the way we try to do it at the, at the War College and other sister institutions in the U.S. and at other uh, in other nations. Uh, is simply by building in the reflex to reach for reach for bigger uh, sources of guidance. We spend, uh, in, I teach in the strategy and policy department. What we do is uh, with the first couple of weeks of the class, uh, of the class we spend time with uh, the, the classic theorists, Clausewitz, Sun Tzu, uh, Mao Zedong. Now, along the way, we also encounter, encounter the, the classic maritime theorists. So we try to, we try to essentially build these big ideas into, uh, into our uh, into our officers and our diplomats and so forth into their language so that they reach for those sources of guidance when they are when an immediate decision is in fact uh, demanded of them uh, so it's certainly when somebody asks me for an, just like you just did if you ask me for an immediate uh, output that's what I, that's my lexicon that I reach for uh, and we try to get our students to do the same thing well I can only really give you the sort of a bit of a UK story which is um, the answer to your question is the National Security Council so that's not a sort of a, a body that has to um, muster in a particular room uh, in a formal way. It can be a series of phone calls to bring together the quick uh, response to a crisis. But that then has to sit against what you, I think, very correctly imply are the strategic long-term considerations associated with an event that has occurred uh, in the uh, in conjunction with the existing foreign policy ambition for the UK. So that balance, that tension between the established ambition of a government for its, its country's place in the world set against the uh, unfolding circumstances which may either align or destabilize that position are resolved very, very quickly. And interestingly, most of the, stu the, most of the stuff is done almost instinctively. Um, you know, Unsurprisingly, very senior levels of government are populated by senior policy advisors, senior civil servants who have a lot of experience in this area, and, and they have the respect of military leaders because it's their job to get this right pretty much first time, and they do. So what we do is we allow that process to develop, and then a subset of that process is the role or not of military capability. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, sirs. Uh, Com Commodore Vince Di Pietro, Commander Fleet Air Arm. If I could uh, perhaps just uh, bring this towards a discussion or a question I have about the horseshoe nails rather than grand strategy. At the moment, uh, many defence forces rely very heavily on commercial support and support from commercial entities whose nationalities and business models, etc., may be based in other parts of the world, so that clouds the, the issue of national interest a little bit. But more importantly, how do you see, noting that the capability you're about to embark on, for example, Sir George, is the carrier which will last 50 years, do the current business models and the current expectations of what we expect from industry to support us, are they going to be able to serve us into the future in environments where we might need more flexibility to be able to align emerging and or urgent um, foreign policy initiatives with the defence's ability to respond to them? Vince, that's a fantastic question. You always were a brilliant pilot. 
<laughs> he was my very first. I was his very first student. Okay, so here we are. This ab initio instructor climbs into an aircraft next to me. It's a gazelle mark something or other. And we're at 705 Squadron in southwest Cornwall in the UK. And I don't think Vince was shaking, but I was, because this is a new instructor. Can you imagine? Anyway, we, we landed safely, and I think uh, we looked after each other at first sortie. Vince, uh, defense industry is very capable, in my experience, of responding to this challenge. Why? It's a market-driven opportunity. These guys want to make money. They want to make profit. They want to succeed. They want to survive. They will evolve. That's the nature of their trade. So, for example, we're asking a very large defense contractor that we use a great deal in the UK to think about supporting us more and more agilely in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, um, Strait of Hormuz area, these guys are responding very rapidly because they see, as I implied earlier when I spoke, that the UK is not back, the UK is not keeping its Royal Navy stuck back in the UK. It's, it's, it is in, an engaged force that has moved forward into certain theaters. And so they have to respond. The real question is how do you write the contract that allows that flexibility to exist across the operational space when things start to get a bit racy? And that's a very interesting question because it's not so much whether middle managers or senior managers within the company are prepared to underwrite a contract that gives you the flexibility as the space gets hotter. It's really whether the individuals concerned the engineers, the program and project managers are prepared to take what you might argue is going to be physical risk. And therefore, you do reach eventually a ceiling to the concept because the contractor who comes on board to fix a component of a phased array radar um, is he's not going to stay with you in the middle of hostilities unless he's paid a great deal of money and his contract allows him to do so because of the duty of care. But the general journey of flexibility of contracting solutions is precisely as you imply, it's getting very much better all the time. I also think that there's um, a more subtle interpretation to the question, which is that the relationship between industry and the military is graying at the edges. This is how it works. The intellectual property rights that made a contractor come and support a particular unit in a particular place for a particular reason mean that that would be a civilian, but it could be in the future, that in order to achieve the flexibility you want in the operational space, that that becomes a military guy who's given access to the intellectual property rights as part of the contract with that company to achieve the software knowledge to make the changes which are normally achieved by a visit. In other words, you start to gray the boundaries. That's pretty complex contractual business, but that's how you may end up achieving solutions that give you the best value for money and allow that company to make the best penetration in the market space. So we're right there now, literally right there now, and I think there's a lot more of that to come. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have time for one more question, if there is. Uh Uh, thanks very much, Eric Grove. As the person who provided the link between Ken Booth's triangle <laughs> and the current British maritime doctrinal triangle, I'd just like to ask Professor Holmes, does he think that, in fact, the new wording is helpful? I mean, he pointed quite rightly to some of the problems of the old triangle, and I grappled with that in Future of Sea Power too. Uh, I tried putting circles, actually, and thought that might help. Uh, I'm not sure it did. But it, uh, is converting diplomatic role to international engagement a uh, constabulary role to maritime security and keeping war fighting at the bottom as the foundation. Do you think that solves some of the intellectual problems of the original Booth trial? I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a great question. And I, uh, it's not something I, as, as I uh, respond to the other question, I haven't kept up with uh, Professor Booth uh, quite as closely as you obviously have. Uh, just to take sort of an Orwellian response uh, with regard to you know politics and the English language and that sort of thing, it, international engagement to, to me it actually takes some meaning out of the out of the term diplomacy. 
Uh, international engagement sounds like a process, and uh, diplomacy sounds like a, a pro sounds like something where you send diplomats out, out to uh, negotiate on behalf of their countries. To me, that to me, this, just the word seems it seems a lot more effective in, the, the, in its older sense than uh, uh, than moving it into something that sounds much more bureaucratic and process oriented. Uh, so I think so. I'm not sure that really would. I'd have to think about it more, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Really, certainly not at the first blush. Does it uh, really uh, answer my objections to that? As far as constabulary, I just, I've always, uh, uh, a big part of my role, uh, work on Theodore Roosevelt was about his idea of an international police power. And I use that term constabulary a lot in, in, in that particular book. Looking all the way back to the to the British mo the British model, constabulary duty is quite different. Uh, it's quite different in some ways from police duty. If you think about what a constable is, as, as opposed to what a police officer is, uh, con the constable actually tends to the health, welfare, and morals of the people as well as their physical security and so forth. It's another one of those very rich words that I would uh, I would be very reluctant to uh, to jettison. So. Eric, you know me well, so you're going to forgive me for this. You lost me off the word triangle. <laughs> one thing that struck me and I didn't put in my paper or in my, in my remarks that is uh, probably worth, uh, worth uh, bringing up is that Clausewitz actually does the same thing in his idea of a trinity or a holy trinity. Uh, he actually he actually puts uh, rational subordination as one of the poles uh, one of the poles of a triangle a Clausewitzian trinity or as we call it the war, co the war college a triangle so he and he in fact uh, he in fact uh, lumps in the uh, lumps in the rational decision makers along with the instruments uh, passions and all of these other things that, uh, that drive nations at war so uh, by no means is uh, professor booth uh, guilty of something that uh, that other that other very well known people have done as well <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, uh, I might uh, draw this session to a close. I think uh, you'll agree with me it's been uh, a very, uh, very fruitful uh, discussion uh, covering uh, a wide range of topics there relating to uh, the role of navies in, uh, in foreign policy, both uh, theoretical and practical. Uh, a great session. Uh, thank you very much for your questions, and I would ask you to please uh, join with me in thanking our two speakers, Professor James Holmes and Admiral Sir George Zambalas.